Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. As you heard, my name is Rose Sherman Williams. Before the Second World War, I lived in a city by the name of Radom in Poland. I had quite a large family and a very, very close family. Unfortunately, at this time, they're all deceased. My immediate family had consisted of my father, my mother, who were in the early 40s. Grandma came to live with us in 1938. Grandpa became sick of pneumonia, and so my father insisted Grandma come and live with us. Next, I had a brother who was 17 years old. I was 12 years old in 1939. I had a sister 10 years old and a little brother 7 years old. And like I said, they're all deceased at this time. On September the 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland and my city of Radom. When the very short time of being occupied by the Germans, posters came on all over town. The first of the agenda was no Jewish child could get a public education. All schooling was prohibited. Next day came out, you had to wear an armband with the Jewish star. Rotham had a population of about 130,000, 30,000 of being Jewish. And they went to City Hall got the name of all the Jewish names and addresses and came out with a new poster that if you had a radio in your possession, you had to take it to City Hall. Now that had all our names and addresses, they would go from house to house in search. If they found a radio, they either imprisoned you or killed you without any questions asked. On and now, horrible atrocity of pardon. People would disappear, we never heard of them. Within a short time of a few months, about close to 10 months, they start building a ghetto. Unfortunately, the street where we lived did not belong to the ghetto. And so we got a letter from City Hall to leave our home in one hour. Can you imagine what would you take? It was such a difficult, difficult time. My parents didn't know where to start. Mom tried to put three, four dresses on us girls. Dad some pants on the little ones. But the beauty part about it was we had some wonderful, wonderful Gentile neighbors. And they came and asked my father what they could do to help. Dad sat down with us a minute asking, their wonderful neighbors had offered to save us four children and hide us out till after the war. They took a minute to sit down and ask us would we like to go with our neighbor. And from the little one to the oldest one, we all start crying. We didn't want to be separate from our families. And in such a mood, with those packages and suitcases and pillowcases, we walked into the ghetto. We didn't even have a room allotted. They gave us an empty basement. No water, no heat, no toilet. Oh my God, we were sitting in those blankets for almost a day and a half without any food or water. Dad was handy, found some brick and finally connected it to a chimney and we built a little stove. My mom finally started warming up some water to clean us up and feed us. After that episode, after a short time, they claimed that they're gonna send some people out to some working camps. One or two of the people who were able to escape came back claiming those were no working camps. Those were liquidation camps. They pushed the people into showers that looked like showers with shower heads, but what would come out was gas. Once the people were gas, they put them in the crematorium to burn. 
We were so gullible we couldn't believe how can such atrocities be possible. But that was the truth and that was the fact that what was happening. After that episode, our wonderful neighbors continuously tried to bring us some food to the gates from the ghetto every few days. My dad continuously begged his children to tell them not to risk their life. What if the SS or the Polish police would catch them? They would imprison them or even shoot them. And so, please tell our wonderful neighbors not to risk their life. But in spite of it, they continuously come doing. Every few days after they, they had built the ghetto, in the ghetto they made all kind of offices and uh, they would, the Germans would come in every morning to the ghetto wanting a quarter of so many people to go to work. In the beginning people voluntarily went to work because if you had a chance to go out from the ghetto you were able to purchase some food. But after a while people start hiding out. And we were wondering what happened. What we found out was in spite that they needed you, they would mistreat you so badly that people decided rather than be beaten and mistreated not to go to work and people start hiding out. One day my dad was very, very religious. And every morning he would get a designated group of people into a certain room and uh, they would pray. One time going home from his prayers, he got caught by the Germans. And we were so scared, we didn't know what happened to our dead, because usually people disappeared, we never heard from them again. And, but we found out word by mouth that he only went to work and should be back soon. As we were standing with our wonderful neighbors at the gate from the ghetto, we saw our father walking in his shirt full of blood, his chin all torn up. We ran to him, Daddy, what happened? He told us he went over to a German asking a, a wreck. He had to do some cleaning. And then he had a small beard, and they grabbed that beard with a lot of meat from his chin. This was the disruption. And so after that episode, they decided they're going to dig a hole in that basement deep enough to about six feet and uh, we carried out those dirt that night and we put a barrel of water over that hole so it wouldn't look like there's a hole because the Germans start coming from house to house looking for people to go to work. After that episode it took another about four months when they came out that they're going to liquidate completely the Rada Maghetto. It was so undecided, what should we do? Should we all go out at that night alone? Or should we leave those loved ones behind? We decided we all better go out and stay a line of five. My grandmother was holding my hand when she looked over to the right noticed the Germans pulling out children from mother's arms. Mom, not wanting to give up their children, they would shoot the mother and grab those children thrown on the stones. When my grandmother saw that, she started losing my hand and running. I started running after my grandmother. Where are you going? She said she was going to pick up those children. And I said, Grandma, don't you realize what's going on, trying to push her back in line? When the German noticed the commotion, come running, what's going on here? I said, nothing, sir, nothing, sir. He turned his rifle around. He bit me really hard in the middle of my head. I still have a bald spot. Hair never grew back. And the next thing I heard, was a shot, and he had shot my grandmother for no reason whatsoever. It took me many, many years. The director from the Holocaust Memorial had approached me many a times to become a speaker for the school children. I could not find peace enough to be able to block out that vision of my grandmother laying at my feet. 
wondering how many people had stepped on the body of my grandmother and we unable to bury her. One of my children became sick of the, of the, not, not my, uh, sick of leukemia. And up to that point, I never told no one my own story. My children knew that I was a Holocaust survivor, but I never told them. But when my son became sick of leukemia, knowing I'm gonna lose my oldest son, I told him my story. He made me promise that I will write down my story and tell it to the children and grandchildren. I promised him, but it took me almost 20 years to be able to finally realize I'm getting old. My story needed to be told. When I was approached again by the director, I finally became a speaker for the last eight years. And after that episode, I was sent to an ammunition, 90, excuse me, in 19, 1942, August the 6th. That was when I was completely separated from my family and sent to an ammunition factory in Poland by the name of Pionki. While working there, we were so very, very hungry and I couldn't get over the fact that I have none of my family, not knowing if anyone is alive. I continuously cried. Next to me was a lady. She was Polish descendant, but as a young lady, she, her parents emigrated to Germany and she became a German teacher. Her name was Elsie. She continuously tried to encourage me, wanted to become my surrogate mother and help me. She said, please stop crying. It's not gonna help you. Maybe one day we would all go back when the war might be over. On and on, she was a tremendous help in my life and encouraged me continuously. But I continuously cried. Working in that ammunition factory was so difficult and no food most of the time. The, we had three centuries to go through, but some people were able to bribe some of those centuries. And I'm sure you're all aware to make a bomb, you need alcohol. The factory had cried a lot. And we know we shouldn't steal, it's a sin. But when you're that hungry, you forget what's right and what's wrong, in spite of it. So some people helped themselves to some alcohol when they had bribed those guys at the entries. The sentries were, when they were on, on, on post, they would help people would help themselves to some alcohol. Usually we were always told when an inspection was due. But one night, we didn't hear anything. I was on the 3 to 11 shift. When, the, when we went through the first centuries, we were fine. We went through the second century, we were fine. We had three centuries to go through. When we got to the third one, three huge assessments were standing with a whip beating us, not knowing that some people might have some alcohol on them. When those people realized that they have alcohol, they start throwing it away. One of the oldest assessment grabbed one of the soldiers and said, start counting. Every 10 person goes to the right, 11 person goes to the left. We were 270 people. They took out 27 people that night. And next morning, those 27 people were hanged. We were told we cannot look down. We had to stay and look up. Had they noticed that you looked down, you would feel the whip on your back. After almost two days of our standing and watching those same people, 
we were told no given any food or any water. You might not believe this, but it's a truth and it's a fact. You can withhold hunger for a very, very long time, but almost impossible to survive without water. Our friend was the night we would run into the woods and relieve ourselves, grab some snow to our perched lips. After the second day, they came out with a new poster that we were gonna be sent out. It was almost the end of 43, the beginning of 44, due to the fact that the Russian are bombarding very heavily. And so on foot, we had to walk to a railroad station for almost 18 kilometers. When we got there, they gave us two pails to relieve ourselves, pushing 80 to 90 people in a wagon that would hold the most, maybe 20. The people we were so tired that anyone trying to go to those pails would remain most of the time in the air because people would step on them and not because anybody wanted, but they suffocated we were so tight in there, no air, just the smell alone could have killed you. Our destination this time was Auschwitz. When we got there, when they opened the wagons, they told us we had to leave everything behind. Only even our shoes and boots, which they tried to take away and give us a little pieces of paper when we claimed to be able to claim our things that we had with us because they said we had to leave everything behind. Although that wasn't true, those papers didn't, weren't worth anything. By taking away all our shoes, they gave us some horrible Hollandies wooden clocks. They were in the winter time, the snow would stick to it. In the summertime, the mud would stick to it. Anytime you would try to knock it off, the couple would be there with a whip beating you because you went behind the line. While we were in Auschwitz still, the first thing they did is send us into showers that looked like showers, but they showed us that water really did come out this time. And they pushed us in, we were so scared, we thought, guess what's gonna come out? But they did show us that water did. Once we were showered, they kept all women's hair and we all were bereaved of our names. We were given a tattoo, which I still carry on my arm, A15049. That's the tattoo I had, the number 